Okay, I'll call this meeting to order at 7.03. First off, adoption of the agenda. Sorry, there is uh, one addition to the agenda. What? That we would like to present. Um, it's a letter of support for the um, daycare, or the, yeah, the Clarkson daycare. Um, it's on here. Uh, no, that's something else. Oh, you got another one. Yeah, another oh, they, one. They want to open it up, sir. So, oh, yeah, so I, I'm sure you heard on the news a little while ago that they are opening up uh, select daycare facilities uh, to be able to support um, uh, AHS and other uh, critical service staff. Um, to be able to continue working. Um, our uh, facility hasn't been selected at this point in time, and this is a letter of support to, to get it open to support our uh, staff in the AHS facilities here in town and whatnot. Karine, did you put it in the agenda somewhere? What so number? what we thought it would work is as number 15, right before the daycare request regarding their, their uh, costs. So if we could add it as number 15, it's an RFP as well. That would be great. And, and to make an addition to the agenda, we need unanimous consent. Yeah. So no funny business there, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to <laughs> <laughs> You're making a motion to amend the agenda? Yeah. All in favor of amending the agenda? Carry. And somebody to adopt the agenda. Dr. Schultz, is that you? Sure. Yeah. All in favor of adopting the amended agenda. All right. Okay, we're on to regular meeting minutes, March 9th. Craig, do you see anything in there? Um, no, all looks good other than I do not believe Gavin was at our last meeting. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he was here. I think he was. Was he here? I thought he was sick. He wasn't at our 15th early meeting. I stand corrected. That's okay. No, informed. Everything looks fine. I'm informed. informed. <laughs> adopt the minutes of March 9th as presented. All in favor? Carried. Okay, we have two delegations. First up, Jason Hemily, Director of Emergency Management, and he's going to update us on COVID 19. Welcome. Thanks for having me, everybody. <clears throat> Love this fish there. Yeah, it's, it's up to you. Good. Okay, so have you guys had a chance to read the info brief? Yep. Do you want me to go through it point by point? No? Do you have questions about the info brief? Then? I got some points. Okay. Well, first off, one of the things I spoke to you up front about this was uh, snowbirds. It's become a problem in Lethbridge. And Lethbridge has addressed it by putting security in the parking lot to stop the snowbirds from going into the stores. And putting our citizens at risk. I know I'd like to know what council's feelings are, are on this, but I personally would like to see Ryan like swing through there at least once an hour and uh, ask them to either phone in your order and have it brought out to them or move on. What's council so feelings? I know there's two morning people who return from America, the snowbirds, they do not be able to leave their homes, is that what you're saying? No, they no, they're, they're coming home. Yeah. In their RV. Yeah. And Lethbridge is not allowing them to go into the stores because they're supposed to go right. home. Right. They should be on a 14-day quarantine. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're supposed to go home. They're get stopping somebody. at grocery stores before um, they go home. So they're they're threatening the health of Lethbridge. So Lethbridge has stomped on it. And now they're stopping here. And I took a walk past. It took me four to five minutes to walk the two blocks that you can see them. And it was the time I walked that, two RVs stopped. So it's a problem. Ryan would, have to be Ryan would have to just swing by, and you're not going to get them all, but I think if word got out that we're not going to allow it either, they'll stop stopping. A presence. A presence. At least once an hour. That's that's my feelings on it. I think it's a serious. These yeah, are the people. Right we're pretty safe if we keep stop here. following the rules. Mm -hmm. But if we allow this mm -hmm. type of thing to mm -hmm. carry on, then it's going to become a problem. And they're doing such a good job at everything. <clears throat> Oh, they're wiping down, they're taking care. Yeah, they're 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 they're
Well, that's the other thing. There's a lot of Calgary shoppers, and you can't start picking out no, but the Calgary shoppers. But there's a lot of Calgary shoppers coming and entering that store also because they they're having problems getting product from Calgary. So that's one problem that you you can't. No, this is from the But this is Snowbird, yeah. and Snowbirds you're supposed to go home. I mean, we've all done it for somebody. I've done it. Brad's done it. I'm sure all of you've gone and got groceries for somebody that's isolated, or is or know somebody that's done it. Oh, it's not so hard. Both relatives coming home. Yeah. Don't go to the grocery store. Don't go to the restaurant. <laughs> Stay home. Yeah. And we've had all of us to help you out. And we've had the snowbird say, call the restaurant that comes through and say, we're coming in for you today and we can't get our truck at our beforehand. And and he was being held up in their in their RV and they got called from the border. And they 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 pack it and go. Those are the most responsible out of us, mm -hmm. out of the bus. Um, but yeah, we've had folks that have come up and, and driven up and just received a nice tan and go, are you just coming home from? Yeah, okay, well, they got home and here you go, don't bring it out. Yeah. And, so, and IDA offers the same service. If they phone, tell them what they need, they'll bring it out. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's, it's going to have to be placed on us. To protect our and citizens. And there wasn't a thought, you know, Ryan, to give them that information so he could say to people, you know, we, we can't, so when you order in, someone will bring it out yeah. to you because we're not trying to stop Joe's business, but. We're trying to keep our citizens it. safe. And his staff. So smart. And his staff. If it goes through he his does staff, have signage up. Serious problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're scared. Oh, yeah, his staff is living in fear. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, that if that's forward. okay with council, that's one thing I'd like to recommend that you you enforce. Okay. No objections. So. so the next thing is all the towns and, and Calgary, Brad said Calgary did today. I, I missed that. But they're shutting down their playground. And I think that's the responsible thing to do. I know you guys have talked about leaving them open for somewhere for the kids to play, but that's just promoting the same problem. You're not doing the proper social distancing. Any comment from you guys about that? Totally in favor of I think it just makes sense. I That's why mean, every other senator is doing it. Even <coughs> the MD of uh, Ranch Town did it. So they must have a couple of parks that they need to do. Yeah. <coughs> we definitely had the conversation today at an emergency management meeting. And it was decided at that point, with the information that we had, that some recreational opportunities for children and families to do is still desirable and we decided that we put up extra signage reminding people to social distance and all that stuff now the flip side of that is is you can't disinfect a playground so mother nature does it to a certain extent but that's the risk yeah. so and i think we got to protect our citizens again okay. <clears throat> i mean it's going to fall to us to, to make the tough decisions for yeah. sure and if that's the wish of council, we can get them with that. So that would include the, the four town parks, but that would leave the school parks blank. So the school <laughs> parks, uh, we really don't have authority. Right, the school would be. So I, but I would like you to phone the schools and ask them. So I can give you back under <clears> that. How it worked in Manton was the school division closed their parks at, because Manton closed the public parks. So they just so, followed through. So we just got to notify them and they'll close the parks. Right. Yeah. So I, I I would like to see that, yeah. and also the exercise equipment in uh, Centennial up up in Patterson. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean that's I I never yeah. see anybody exercising, <laughs> but I see kids crawling all over it all the time, playing on it. Yeah. So that's, and we can't disinfect it. That's just closing down like the playground part. You just basically put a little part. Oh yeah, you just you tape off the equipment. The yeah. equipment. It's caution tape you put around the park. Yeah, and sign it. It's just to keep them off the equipment, but you're more than welcome to go play outside yeah. and have fun at the park. Right. So the park's not closed, just the playground equipment's yeah. temporarily out of service. I got it then. So do you want us to still put up some signage then, reminding yeah. people about social distancing and all that stuff? Okay. Okay. That's and that that's another thing. I've been doing a lot. Of, we all have been doing a lot of walking because it's really about all we got left outside of watching the TV or reading a book. <clears throat> so I've been doing lots of walking, and I I would like to send a thank you out to Clarecombe. I mean, I have seen such 
responsible people. Yeah. They, I mean, you stop and talk to somebody, everybody stays six feet away. And when you're walking past, somebody moves out on the road and goes around. I think Claire's home has stepped up and are showing their colors here. Yeah. They're, they're, they're being very responsible. And I'd like to extend a thank you out to Claire's home and, and thank them for doing the social distancing and doing the right thing. I mean, I've just seen it in droves in the last yeah. four days walking around town. Yeah. It's amazing. <clears throat> I think it's a it's a, a good comment on our town when you see that. I'm really encouraged by the the different ac I guess you could say aspects of online stuff that are taking place. For example, the East Side online <clears throat> yeah. right? That's a great resource that people can still do exercising online. You're thinking outside the box. So I really like that. I really do. And I think that's a really good like community effort to keep everybody engaged and for lack of a better word, social interacting in a different way. Yeah. No, Claire's on really pulled together well. Um one of the photographers going around town is just taking random pictures and, and putting it in on Facebook just for something for us to talk about feedback. and to give us some positive feedback. I mean, it, yeah. it's great. The reaction in Clairsville has been very supportive. I've heard very minimal negative about what we've had to close and what we will be closing. I, I just think Clairsville has done a great job standing up to this. Yeah. Put a thank you on the sign I, page. I think the law well, might get well, but. <laughs> I actually posted what you guys just did, and I posted Claire's home as well. So. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I think it's needed. I mean, Claire's home has done well. I have not seen any crowd. I mean, it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. People have been very responsible, getting together in their front yard, <laughs> staying separated. Mm -hmm. oh, it's been good. Any other comments out of what Jason's information about what we're doing in town? Very much. Well, it all ran really well. I do have to say that it's been a really good collaboration between multiple municipalities, between all of our staff. They've taken it very seriously, and everybody is working together phenomenally. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we don't need an emergency command center to keep operations going or anything like that. We don't need a single local emergency at this point. I mean, your staff is amazing. They've done a great job. <clears throat> I would agree with that. I don't declaring a state of emergency. The only thing it does is it gives us a little more power over Building. property and buildings and right. stuff. And we I don't see the need for it in Claire's home right now. No, if the need arises, we'll address it then. Yeah. Just stay in contact, really. Like if you guys hear of issues or concerns, the only way we can do something about it or help with the situation is with the mayor. So thank you for everything. Thank you. Okay, Jason, thanks. Nice to see you. Jason, nice. <coughs> See ya. Yeah. Okay, number two, we have Darren Evanson up with our financial statements. Good evening, everybody. I think you all have a copy of the electronic yep. one by Charlie, okay. so hopefully you had a chance to look through it. Um, as per usual, I'll just keep it to the highlights. I don't need to go through in too much detail, but if there are any questions that you have, Bob, I'll, be, I'll do my best to answer them. I'm pretty sure um, Blair has already gone through the, the numbers with most or all of you anyway. So, um, I'm sure you're well informed already, so I'll, I, I'll keep it to the highlights. Um, independent auditor's report is is something that, of course, that you pay us, us to do. The report this year is different than it's been in the past. It used to be three paragraphs and a lot shorter, and now it's expanded. If you've, you've probably seen it in the other um, organizations that you've been on, the, on boards or whatever, but it's moved up. The opinion is moved to Ms. Brunt. Um, our opinion is that these financial statements be fairly presented as open conversation to the town. So it's clean audited opinion, just like we'd always expect. It does give more detail on the responsibilities of management and the auditor than it used to. So I won't read that to you, but if you haven't gone through that once, um, then I would probably recommend that you try to scroll through it one time at least. It's not that exciting, but um, 
Page four, statement of financial position. So this is this is our balance sheet. So it's assets, liabilities, and accumulated surplus. Um, financial assets are at the top. Last year was 5.7 million. This year it's down to 4.3. So cash is down, um, largely because we invested some of the pure tangible capital assets. And receivables are down. So you had some grants receivable last year that you collected this year. So in a nutshell, your financial assets are down because of those two reasons. Um, liabilities, so what the town owes at the end of the fiscal year <coughs> went down from about 6.9 million to about 5.2 million. The biggest change there, the biggest decrease is deferred revenue. So you receive a lot of grants in advance, um, in particular your LSI grants and the federal gas tax grants. Last year you had some of those that you hadn't spent, this year you spent more of those grants. So as you spend those, the deferred revenue gets recognized as revenue and the liability portion disappears. So that's the main reason your liabilities are down. Your liabilities actually decreased more than your assets decreased. So your net financial debt position, while it's still negative, it's still debt, it's improved over last year by over 300,000. So um, one of the indicators we look at is your net financial debt or net financial assets if you're in that position. Um, and you had an improvement in that score this year. So that's good. Then moving down, we add in our non-financial assets, which basically is your tangible capital assets, and a little bit of uh, inventory. So what happened there, as I'm sure you're aware of, is your tangible capital assets went down by um, about three, well, about 3.1 million. The biggest chunk of that is because of the old school building that we were going to renovate and convert into town office, and the project uh, was not being feasible, so we wrote that off, and that was almost a little over 2.9 million. So we're going to see that number a couple places mm -hmm. um, throughout the financial statement. So that's, that's what, if there's one thing that's unusual this year, that's what that is. It's a, it's a paper write-off because for the most part, you think you got that building donated to you two years ago or whatever we do. It was, it, or you paid, you paid a dollar for it, yeah. but we write, recorded it as, as an estimated fair value at the time. So maybe they put some additional costs into it as they were limited it, but um, then we wrote all that off. Most of it is a paper loss just because it's done. We will we record that the donation revenue when you got it, and now we just hand out the paper. So that's the statement of financial position. The next page is the statement of operations. So this shows us how we did for the year ended December 31st, and we can compare to the budget as well. When you look at the revenues, I really don't see a whole lot of surprises or um, big things from last year. Overall, our revenues are down 127,000 from the previous year. Um, the biggest chunk of that is, is in government transfers. So they went down from 801,000 to 540. Um, otherwise, and that was mostly just due to um, some rent grants for the arena last year that we had that we didn't have this year. And uh, some PRP funding from uh, last year as well. So uh, keeping it very high life, I can, I can give you some, some details on those those revenue, revenue lines if you want, but I'm guessing that you won't. So. <laughs> Expenses, again, when I look through for highlights, the one big highlight is administration expense, and it sticks out like a, a bit of a sore thumb. 4.1 million this year compared to last year's 1.3 million. Administration decided that we should put a note in there to explain that, why it's like that. It's a weekly note system that's been added to the system. Basically, that's because of the write off of that, of that statement. And, um, it's the biggest portion of that expense and the, and the reason why it's up and, and the reason why it's over budget. So that's about 2.8 million. When you look down at total expenses, we're up about 2.8 million from last year or over last year. So other, otherwise, we're very comparable and we're, we're very close to budget as, as you would expect. So other than that one item, it's really a no surprise uh, statement. So bottom line, we have a deficiency of revenue over expenses from operations of 4 million. Um, 2.8 million of that is from my write off. We add in our government transfers for capital and then we get a net deficiency of 2.8 million. 5.4 million came from last year because of um, writing off the school this year and last year, the year, year ago, we had more capital projects and more capital grants. So, um, so that's the highlights. Really, if you go through the rest of the statement, there's some, some good information. One of the notes that I would probably Highlight would be note nine, which is on page 14. That's the accumulated surplus um, note. 
And you know, each account has a total of here the surplus of about 20, it's about 29 million, down from last year's 31.6 million, but down from that it lost this year. Of that surplus, almost 26 million has already been spent and invested in the Canada capital asset pool. So it's not available for future spending. Um, it's already spent, but sitting in assets. The other three, little over three million, is sitting in their unrestricted surplus or internally restricted surplus with um, one of the debtors applied for particular purposes. So out of the 29 million total accumulated surplus, only three of that is actually available for future spending. When you look at your annual expenses, uh, normalized, they're probably somewhere around 8 million marks. So we've got three, two, three, four months worth of expenses sitting in, in surplus. So it's not a, an excessive amount that we can take on. If people are asking me why we have such a big surplus, we have our taxes aren't going down. We don't have that data for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there's other good notes and stuff in there, lots of good information, but um, for the most part, I think a lot of it is, is self explanatory, and we've already gone through it. Um, I won't bore you, I guess, with all the details, but if you do have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to do, a, do my best to respond. No, I would not. Larry pretty much went into detail the other night with Larry. Larry did a great job on the presentation, so I would not surprise me. Yeah, Larry <clears> the <throat> one that outsourced the uh, Oh, sure. Uh, so I've also got here, um, I think I've presented these in the past, indicators of financial condition. Mm -hmm. So some graphical um, indicators of how the town's doing compared to other towns in Alberta, and um, I won't go through them all, but I'll just kind of leave it for your information. I'll kind of go through three or four of them just to kind of give you an idea and a refreshing memory of how, how it all works. If you flip into page two, the first graph there says um, the total assets liabilities. You see there's four lines. The blue line is the town of Terracombe, and that extends up to 2019. The other three lines are compared out. And those only go up to 2018 because all the results of those <coughs> haven't been published yet. So it's a bit of one year behind, but it does show a big trend. The one I think is probably the most um, useful to compare against is comparable town average. So that's the green line. The red line is all the towns in Alberta. The purple line is all the municipalities in Alberta that have a comparable population, something under 25%. So it includes counties, or MDs, and so some of their numbers are obviously different than a town. So let's just look at the capital assets and, and things like that. So I'd say the, um, the green line is the one that we've compared ourselves to the, for the most part. So in this particular graph, assets to liabilities, the higher up you are on the graph, the better. So you can see the town is, is lower than the average, but has been improving over the last few years. So. So there's that. Then you see that it sounded like I said I want to go through all of them, but um, if we go to page three, there's one called net debt to annual revenue, the second one. Basically, if you look at the bottom right corner, it says 0.11. So you have 907,000 of net debt, and your annual revenues are about 8.1 million. So 11% um, of your annual revenue is basically. Um, that's a portion of your annual revenue is, is your net debt position. And if you compare that to the comparative, you'll see that the other municipalities that have net debt on average have a higher net debt position than Terracom does. So you score a little bit better than some of the comparatives on, on that score. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> page four shows operating expenses to, to the taxable assessment. Um, the lower you are on this, the better. It's just typically you're going to want to see this line sort of flat. Um, the taxable assessment is, is what we use as our measure of the overall economy. So if when your assessor goes out and assesses all the value of all the properties in the town, as that goes up, you think your expenses are sort of going up on a per month basis. This year it's spiked because we've written off the school and that shows as an expense. Otherwise it would be flat. So it looks funny here, but that's that's why it looks funny. The next page there's one called public debt charges to revenue. Um, and basically you have debt servicing. So each year, well, next year you're gonna pay principal and interest payments of $630,000. Um, 
and you compare that to your operating revenue, it's about 9%. So 9% of your revenue is currently like going to pay down principal interest on your debt. If you look at the schedule of debt payments that you have to make your regular payments in four years, that'll go down from 9% of your revenue to under 5%. So you're, you've got some debt that's coming off each year, and, and uh, in particular in the next few years, that will increase quite a bit, assuming you don't take on additional debt. But, um, page six is one net book value compared to the cost of your tangible capital assets. And you see these lines are basically flat because um, just because you write off your capital assets over a, a gross value. Um, you're down a little bit lower than comparative. And I think the main reason for that is your capital, your amortization policies were a little bit more aggressive than comparable towns in the past. So you've written off some assets faster than um, other towns, and your population hasn't really gone up very much either. So that's that is between those two things. So you are you are lower than the comparatives on that one. And then I guess the one other one that I would probably highlight would be on page eight. There are two actual graphs on here. The top one is looking at your, your reserves. Um, and the second one is, is total accumulated surplus or KEP reserves and other unrestricted surplus. So on the second one, if you look at that one, you, you have end of the year you have three million and eighty thousand of spendable surplus. And I, I mentioned that before when you're looking at your total accumulated surplus. And you can see how that's kind of gone from a high of three point nine almost four million two years ago to three million this year. So basically um, you've been investing a little bit more into your infrastructure, your tangible capital assets than you've been bringing in. So that's good because you need to invest in your tangible capital asset pool. That's not sustainable over the long term, nor you've been spending more than what you've been bringing in. So, and I know that administration is well aware of that, but it's just, you can see that here in the, in the graph. Um, the last page shows the comparable municipalities where there's been no different categories. So if you're wondering who they see as being compared to, you can see that right there. So, okay, I don't want to go through all that in detail. I think it's, it does give some good information, and I would probably recommend that maybe you go, go through that in more detail when you have more time. But um, for today, that's kind of what I want to highlight. I also have two letters to go to council. Um, you've probably seen them already, the management letter. Uh, which we don't actually have any recommendations this year. So, and then we have our post audit or audit plan meeting, and there's nothing that we deal with there. So, um, it's pretty well. We've got great cooperation from the administration. If we need to figure anything out, we, we figure it out together. So, thanks, Larry and Green and whoever else helps us out in the number week. <laughs> but, and that is everything that I wanted to cover. Good. Anybody got any questions? Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to Blair. Obviously, he's doing a good job. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, Avail has been great to work with as well. That's good. Great job, Blair. Great job, Avail. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> thank you. So do you want to take a um, quick break for time? Yep. Uh, do we need to get to the motion to oh. approve them first? Oh, yeah. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's just two, the next two items on the agenda are, are to yeah, need to pass before um, we can sign those. Okay, we've got the first one here, request for decision, it's the reverse transfer and bad debt. We've all done that, so we know. Councillor Cutler, question. So I'm going to read the whole thing, so please bear with me as I make some mistakes. Okay. <coughs> Moved by Councillor Cutler to transfer out of the reserve funds for 2019 operational and capital pur purposes in the amount of $506,725 for the year ended December 31, 2019, as follows. Transfers from operating reserves, general, 85835 Debt reduction, 50000 Position recruitment, $1,050. Economic development, 29579 Museum, 6275 Planning and development, $639. Transfers from capital reserves, general $100,002, multi-use community building $3,091, water and sewer $219,945, enforcement vehicle $10,309. All in favor? Carried. 
And would somebody like to make the motion for the unrestricted circle? Councilor West Washburger. Question. Moved by Councilor West Washburger to transfer 2019 unrestricted surplus funds of $394,680 to reserve to the year ended December 31st, 2019, as follows. Transfers to operating reserves general, $15,559. Debt reduction, $34,726. Trust account, $1,040. Economic development, $579. Office, $583. Spilled dirt, $232. Museum $123, Cemetery $15, Planning and Development $200. Transfers to Capital Reserves, General $57,902, Arena $8,360, Multi-Use Community Building $60, Fire Truck $13,417, Parks and Pathways $1,071, Water and Sewer $210,502. Land Development, $5,633. Garbage and Recycling Equipment, $35,403. Acreage Assessment, $825. Tamarack Subdivision, $510. Playground Rehabilitation, $1,013. Enforcement Vehicle, $2,374. Tax Recovery Land, $240. Museum, sorry, $18. And Cemetery, $5,100. All in favor. Carried. And a motion for the, to write off the uncollected amount for the utility account. Councilor Schultz. Question. Moved by Councilor Schultz to approve <coughs> the write off of uncollected amounts for utility account number 9013.001 in the amount of $5,310.56 for the year ended December 31st, 2019. All in favor. Carried. Uh, $219 of state. Here it is. $219 audited financial statements. Uh, we've all been briefed on it. Uh, who would like to make the motion to accept? Councilor Zinn. Make a motion to accept the financial statements as presented. Question. Moved by Councilor Zinn to accept the audited financial statements for the year ended December 31st, 2019, as presented. All in favor? Carry. Hey, I'll tell if uh, you want to sign that in recess, we can get signing papers. And uh, we'll sign some papers quick while we take a quick break here. Leave the camera done. run. Thank you. Thank you. 
So yeah, so I'll just write a PP and then write the insert without setting it on the back. Yeah, what did I put my title to? Okay, number three, bylaw 1693, non-residential tax incentive bylaw. Uh, so the Alberta government presented uh, Bill 7, that's the Municipal Government Property Tax Incentives Amendment Act, on uh, June 4th, 2019. Um, it received royal assent on June 28th. Um, so this bill, in short, allows the municipalities to uh, pass a bylaw to um, allow for full or partial exemption or deferral of property taxes for non-residential properties. Um, the bylaw that uh, the town or council uh, passes must set the criteria by which uh, non-residential properties qualify for this, as well as establish a process for the submission and consideration of applications. Um, so administration uh, has prepared this uh, bylaw 1693, the non-residential tax incentive bylaw, to utilize uh, this updated legislation. Um, this bylaw allows non-residential properties to qualify for tax exemption uh, for development or redevelopment of properties that have increased in assessment value by a minimum of 25%. Um, council can then also take in other uh, factors uh, when they uh, review the applications as to whether they approve it or not. Uh, things such as uh, the economic uh, impact it has on the, the town, uh, maybe the number of uh, new jobs it creates in town, uh, etc. Um, so the, this exemption is a three-year benefit uh, with a 75% exemption in year one, uh, 50 in year two, and 25 in year three. And this exemption is just on the increase in assessment, not on the, the total assessment of that property. Uh, so, for example, if there was a property uh, worth 400000 they uh, did an ex expansion. Uh, it's now worth $500,000. That's a 25% increase. Um, they could qualify for this. Uh, then if, if uh, council approves the application, um, they would get an ex exemption um, of on that, uh, just that $100,000 increase. <clears throat> Any questions? I think this right now it's not going to be too effective, but I think uh, after we come out of the problems we're facing right now, this is going to be pretty substantial for the growth of cars in the future. Question? Oh, somebody make a motion. <laughs> Councillor Cutler. Okay, question. Move by Councillor Cutler to get bylaw number 1693, the non residential tax incentive bylaw, first reading. All in favor? Period. 
There's another person sleeping in there. Oh, yeah. Number four, bylaw 1694, Intermunicipal Collaboration Framework Bylaw. We're all familiar with this. This is second and third reading. Claire, would you like to add anything to it? Or? Nope. Okay. I'll make the second and third. Thanks, Report. Question. Moved by Councillor Schultz that bylaw number 1694, the Willow Creek Regional Intermunicipal Collaboration Framework Bylaw, second reading. All in favor? Carried. Now, who would like to be the third and the final? Councillor Carlson. Question. Moved by Councillor Carlson to be bylaw number 1694, the Willow Creek Regional Intermunicipal Collaboration Framework Bylaw, third and final reading. All in favor? Carried. Bylaw 1695, Consolidation of Bylaws. Again, we're all familiar with this. This is with the cleanup paperwork. Mm -hmm. Would you like to make a second motion? Uh, Councillor second Zimmer, motion. question? Moved by Councillor Zimmer to get bylaw number 1695, the Consolidation of Bylaws bylaw, second reading. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Flashburger. Question. Moved by Councillor Flashburger to get bylaw number 1695, the consolidation of bylaws, bylaw, third and final reading. All in favor? Carry. <laughs> okay. Number five, bylaw 1695, consolidation of bylaw, no, 1696, water and sewer bylaw amendment. Again, we're familiar with this. Larry, do you have anything you want to add? Nope. Would somebody like to make second reading? I'll make a second reading. Councillor Zimmer. Question. Moved by Councillor Zimmer to get bylaw number 1696, the water and sewer bylaw amendment, second reading. All in favor? Carried. Third reading. Councillor Schultz. Question. Moved by Councillor Schultz to get bylaw number 1696, the water and sewer amendment. Oh, water, sorry. The water and sewer bylaw amendment, third and final reading. All in favor? Carry. Okay, number seven. Bylaw 1697, procedural bylaw amendment. <coughs> Second and third reading. Did we have first and last? We had first and last. Okay. And this is to add. If, if I may just speak to it for a second. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, this was presented for first reading at our last council meeting. Uh, at that time, it was just some amendments as per the map review. Um, just to do, uh, there was some things in there about um, that weren't clear that it required. Um, uh, where was it here? Basically, just uh, it wasn't real <coughs> clear that uh, motions on this had to be uh, done in a council meeting. Um, to, to suspend meet or to uh, postpone meetings or, or different things like that. Um, we, uh, administration, uh, with this whole development of COVID-19, um, they had seen some other municipalities that uh, are looking at additional amendments to their procedural bylaw to allow for the electronic attendance at council meetings. Uh, helps just with uh, social distancing or, or if there's council members that are in quarantine or, or self-isolation, allow them to still participate. Um, especially as this thing continues and, and uh, more people are, are sick, it may even become difficult to, to maintain form. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to present this to council as a, an option. Um, the MGA does allow for this option um, within, that, uh, within that act. Um, so we have drafted a, uh, uh, a suggested a amendment, a further amendment to this uh, proposal or to this bylaw. Um, it would require a motion of council to add this amendment uh, to this bylaw before second and third reading. What do you got to say? Then? No, I'll make that motion. No, we've got a comment, soft answer. Oh, comment. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My only comment on it is 
I don't want to see it used as, again, it's, it doesn't clearly define it. Suddenly, you don't want to come. So you're just going in and put your hand in that slot. I don't want to see it as a way out of someone's confidence. Yes. Right? And I don't think this clearly defines that. That's why I'm against it. Because it's a way out for, and I'm not talking about any of you guys, but we're talking about forever here. Future councils, you get a couple of guys that, no, it's pretty easy to stay at home and just go on in your answer. Why do it? Or you're on holidays and you've got something that you're pressing. Suddenly you're going to be calling for your holidays and putting in your two cents. I don't, it, quorum is only four of us. It's not six, it's not five, it's four. I, I don't personally see a need. I think it could be abused in the future. That's my two cents. Let's add something to it to eliminate that problem. Like only in certain circumstances. Yeah, I can bring yeah, it back. See, that's, that's how I find it. See, that's how I read it. Was during a pandemic, not just a. It doesn't say anywhere. In, it doesn't say anywhere in the red. The pandemic was just the reason it triggered. It doesn't say anywhere in the red you got to have the pandemic to trigger it. It just says. It just says it. that. You want to Joe Blow doesn't right. want to come tonight, so he phones in and says, "I'll just do it from here." I look at it from that practical perspective. But it's got to be better yeah. defined than that. No, it's all on practical perspective. I think it's got to be better defined. <laughs> I didn't read that, so what if we could? Can we add that? Mm -hmm. Oh, somehow we can word it. Yeah, I'd be. I'd feel much better with it. I just don't want to see it open to abuse. I mean, we see that in other things. People who don't want to go to work right now just have to phone in and say they got a sore throat and get two weeks off. I mean, there's a lot of legitimate people using that, but there's you're opening up a door for abuse. So I think it's got to be worded differently. That's my two bits. This is what you know. You guys think is best. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> I agree. Four of us can generally make this. Wow. Um, See, that's what I'm uh, not so sure about that either. Right? Well, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to take it out. No, I want it as an option, but I want it better worded. Yeah. So, if we were to add into 5.1e. At the end of that, to just to say, council meetings may be conducted through electronic communications as prescribed within section 199 of the Act with allowance for public participation in extenuating circumstances. So just add in extenuating circumstances to the end of that. Can we have a definition of extenuating circumstances? Sure. But it, and say only at the end of that statement. Can we have another definition? 2.14. See, the way I read that, that though, system. like it reads here, a quorum of council may be achieved even if a council and member of multiple councils are condemned to use the vote. And so if you have four, then I shouldn't be phoning in to vote anyhow because you already got four. It's only if quorum can't be met that you have an electronic address. Former council, it just says. What if you can't get quorum? No, it says you're, you're that, reading that wrong. A quorum of council may be achieved even if a council member or multiple council members attend a meeting through electronic. So the only time this would be come in effect in my reading is if we didn't need quorum. No, no, no. That's not the way it reads at all. It simply reads that we can meet quorum now doing this no matter what. That's like electronic. That's right. what it's saying. It doesn't say it doesn't say you can't use it if we have quorum. It doesn't reading. say that. It says we can use it. We just we just don't want people misusing it. I see what your issue was. I see what you're saying. Even Blair agreed with me on that one. He didn't agree. Doesn't agree with me the other time. It doesn't say. Yeah. It. No. I that's <clears throat> Doug's understanding of that is how I read that as well. But, oh, then, Mike, that makes you wrong. No, it doesn't make me wrong. <laughs> it makes me the way I read it. It makes them informed. It's all yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> I hear what you're saying. I'm not against.
answer. I just don't mm -hmm. want to do the yeah. If we can make it clear, we make it clear. Yeah. To get where we both where we all need anyhow. Yep. So do you want us to come back with something on this? We can't amend it now. We right. can't amend it now right. if we don't agree any on this one. You can. The only thing you guys should keep in mind, sorry to speak up, is that there is three weeks between now and the next council meeting. And the way things have been happening, right. things have been happening so quickly. So if we can, if we can work right something now. out, yeah. it is preferable to, for you guys. I mean, if you have a compromise in your system or whatever, and you can attend this way. So what if you were to define extenuating circumstances in there to something like um, a global or not a global, but a a mass um, so something that's triggering health. something that's triggering the emergency management. Okay, sure. Yeah, like it, mm -hmm. like a, yeah, like a major or a big fire or yeah, yes. fire. Yeah. 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 Something yeah. that's not affecting only one member of council. Yeah. Then I'd be fine with it. Yeah. Yeah. Get this defined. Okay, it won't be abused. Yeah, like. So what if we were to say? Uh, a situation that is affecting multiple members of council. Yeah. As long as it's <laughs> not, <laughs> I'm on vacation. What I meant, we're all going to the Super Bowl, and now we're going to start. <laughs> I like the emergency management part of that. If, you, if there's something that's kicking in the emergency management. Part. I guess, but how do you define what uh, kicking in emergency management is? Because right, right now we haven't stood up our ECC, we haven't stated a soul. So does that we've count? Got, we've got Jason working on it. So once we kick, he's in, always working on it to some that's level. True. Okay, it's got to be multiple members. It's got to affect multiple members on the town-wide province. Yeah. Okay. And that puts us into the position where we can revisit it in six months if need be as well. Yeah. But it's what is in effect. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Welfare situation. yeah, it would be nice to, yeah. if we get this through for, for the wording to be worked on in the future, one day. Sure. It would have to affect all of us. I know we're cut. They have a or something built into the system projector. But how do I call it? You'd be seeing what's projected. Oh, so sorry, you're asking how this would work? Yeah. So the MD has uh, been doing some research into it, trying to figure out how to best work it. Uh, they would do it through Zoom. Uh, Zoom, um, uh, we can put it up on the projector so we can see uh, whoever is uh, remoting in. Um, Zoom will, uh, we can uh, live stream straight through Zoom um, to still live stream through our YouTube smart. channel. I can use your smartphone to, to, um, to dial in. Um, and then you can still upload that video right out of Zoom onto our website, uh, just like we do uh, live stream now. Doctor, I, I went three years with Sandy, and we'd go down to the teleconference room. You could see all the doctors and everything. Well, no, no, not the school doctors. Oh. We do have some of that, but I'm not sure. We could put it together. No, he could put it together. Yeah, but Ed, you're yeah, out. You've got your you phone. Click. That's all you need is your phone. Yeah. 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 yeah, the easy one. Craig. <coughs> yeah, just sign in and then, yeah. Oh, okay. As long as you got Wi Fi. Yeah, you don't have to be tech savvy to do this. Right. That's right. me to do it. Yeah. What's your Wi Fi card? I can get this open and I'm sure I can barely run a computer. <laughs> well, then we're not, you're not working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that's okay. Cool. And we only need four. If your Wi Fi's out, mine's going to be out. Mine's out one side. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a little more techy than that. <laughs> yeah, but if I, we're on the same street. <laughs> so his is out, mine's not on the same street. You're a block away. 
If you're going to make up a story, at least do this right. <laughs> Can you hook into this Wi Fi? Oh, I had to. Yeah. 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 I can see John's post from my house. I can see my own neighbors, but I'm not that big. You got to get that. That's a big deal. Yeah. Okay, maybe uh, we'll take a five minute recess while you do this and turn the camera off. Okay, we'll start off by everybody say hi, Marianne. Hi, Marianne. Hi, Marianne. Okay. Oh, guys are very We have our, uh, we, we're all ready. Bylaw 1697 procedural bylaw amendment. We have an amendment to this bylaw that has to be passed before we can do second reading. So would somebody like to make that amendment? Councillor Sloshberger. Okay. And I have questions so we can hear what you're saying. So moved by Councillor Sloshberger to amend bylaw number 16697, the procedural bylaw amendment, prior to separate reading by amending the following. Remove the current section 2.1cc from bylaw 1697 and add the re revised section 2.1cc to read. Quorum is a majority of those members elected and serving on council, including the mayor for clarity, whose number is currently four. A quorum of council may be achieved even if a council member or multiple council members attend the meeting through electronic communication as defined by section 199 of the Municipal Government Act in extenuating circumstances only. Add section 2.1 KK to bylaw number 1697 as follows. Extenuating circumstances is a serious situation that is affecting multiple members of council and the community as a whole on a large scale that is outside of council's general control. And add a new section 5.1e to read, council meetings may be conducted through electronic communications as prescribed within section 199 of the act with allowance for public participation. Who would like to make that motion? Question. I mean, uh, who's in favor? <laughs> All in favor. Uh, just the second here. I think. You didn't like the way it was. Well. I think the in extenuating circumstances only should have been down on the 5.1e, not on the 2.1cc. Okay. Let's move it and well, read it again. Talk about we just read both places. We just talk about electronic communication. Because I was triggered by this. But this is so how the, how it's meant to be conducted. So we don't want it in both places. Okay. 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 okay, so that'll just mean at the end of quorum, it'll just say as defined by section 199 of the municipal government act and then um, when we're actually talking about council meetings may be conducted through electronic communications as prescribed within section 199 of the act with allowance for public participation and extenuating circumstances only would be the and the first part before that ends with the section 199 of, of the municipal, municipal government, government act, act period yes. correct so is it all clear on that we want to hear it in I'll read it again if you want. Let's hear it again. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So remove the current section 2.1 CC from bylaw 1697 and add the revised section 2.1 CC to read. Form as a majority of those members elected and serving on council, including the mayor, for clarity, whose number is currently full. A form of council may be achieved even if a council member or multiple council members attend the meeting through electronic communication as defined by section 199 of the Municipal Government Act. Add a new section 2.1 KK to bylaw 1697 as follows. Extenuating circumstances is a serious situation that is affecting multiple members of council and the community as a whole on a large scale that is outside of council's general control. Add a new section 5.1E to read council meetings may be conducted through electronic communications as prescribed within section 199 of the act with allowance for public participation in extenuating circumstances only. All in favor? Okay, carried. 
Okay. Who would like to go for the second reading of the Bible? Our Mandarin Bible. Counselor Carlson. Carson. Moved by Councillor Carlson to defile law number 1697, the procedural bylaw amendment, second reading. All in favor. Carry. Who would like to be third? Councilor Schultz. Carson. Moved by Councilor Schultz to defile law number 1697, the procedural bylaw amendment, third and final reading. All in favor. Carry. Okay, with language number eight, bylaw 1699, Community Peace Officer Bylaw, first reading. Blair. Uh, so as with the majority of the bylaws we've just uh, gone through, uh, this is another bylaw uh, that came uh, to light with the map review. Uh, so in the map review, they noted that uh, the NGA requires a bylaw um, for the conduct of uh, um, bylaw officers. Now we don't have uh, strictly a bylaw officer. We have a, a community peace officer, but he also does bylaw. Um, now the community peace officer program through the Solicitor General already requires uh, all of the um, uh, through their agreements and through the bylaw or the policies that are required um, to have all of uh, these things in there uh, over the conduct of of your CPO officer and whatnot. Uh, so this bylaw is just uh, basically a formality to tie uh, the CPO uh, uh, procedures, or sorry, policies and uh, agreement uh, into a bylaw of the council. Would somebody like to read the first reading? Councilor Sosford. Question. Moved by Councillor Sosford <coughs> to the bylaw number 1699, the Community Peace Officer Bylaw, first reading. All in favor. Carry. Media release, Alberta Urban Municipalities, AUMA. Statement from the President, Barry Mora Sheehan. Uh, that's just to take it for information, unless there's any questions you guys got on it. Number 11, Correspondence, Brandon and District Canada Day Society. You skipped one there. Did I really? Mm -hmm. Oh, I did too. Correspondence, uh, Alberta Urban Municipalities, AUMA again, a letter from the Honorable K.C. Mabu, Minister of Municipal Affairs. Blair, anything, got any information on this? Uh, yeah, this is a letter from AUMA to uh, uh, Municipal Affairs, as you stated there. Um, Basically, just stating that uh, the AUMA is ready to collaborate with the government of Alberta um, to support our communities during this uh, public health emergency. Um, among other things, they do um, basically ask the Alberta government to uh, delay some of the stuff that they're working on right now. Uh, some of those uh, include the, the review of the Local Authority Election Act, asking it to be um, postponed until after the 2021 election. <clears throat> um, the Municipal Government Act review uh, look to to delay that to the fourth quarter of 2020. Um, the deadline for the ICS uh, to be extended to April 2021. Now we have just uh, passed ours, so that's not a concern for us. Um, as well as looking for the uh, invoicing of funds from municipalities under the new policing fund model uh, to be postponed to the 2021-2022 uh, fiscal uh, budget, so we can delay the year as well. Take it for information. Now, number 11, correspondence Brown and District Canada Day Society. They're looking for participation and funds, a donation. Now, we'll be involved in our own Canada Days here. Um, we'll be doing our own case. We've got enough going on here that I don't see us donating to Brown. I mean, I as, as good as our fireworks is, I mean, we uh, we save our money and put fireworks out on uh, the, uh, what do you call this? The um, winter time. Winter time. Winter time. Hmm? Well, they do, but I'm just giving you some background. Does anybody have anything to say on it, or we take it for information? Okay, we'll take it for information. Number 12, request for decision, ICS committee appointments. 
Uh, as you can see, I made some recommendations myself and Mike Cutler on the ICF3 with an alternate of loose short. And with that new approval, I will mm. take a bit of motion. <coughs> and I was based on the sanitation, but I had to put myself in there. <laughs> I'll move to appoint the mayor and Councillor Mike Cutler, representing the town, Councillor Dean Schultz, the governor. Okay. Questions? Moved by Councillor Zinner to appoint <coughs> Mayor Jack McPherson and Councillor Mike Cutler to represent the town of Thurston on the ICF committee and to appoint Councillor Lee Schultz as the alternate representative on the ICF committee. All in favor? Carried. Request for decision Cullen Barium location. I vote number one. I, that, I go out there occasionally and that little kind of a horseshoe flower bed I, I don't think it's very attractive I think that's a perfect spot to, to clean that up that's my opinion what do you guys think I move that no comment the horseshoe flower bed is where number one is is there yes the horseshoe flower bed is still there it's oh yeah, yeah it's, it's still tucked. I still would like to see something done on that horseshoe so, so number two spot, uh, um, as is noted there, um, if uh, the Zetner Funeral Home is, is, is suggesting putting in a 30 niche columbarium, and then when that one's full, put in another one after that. Mm -hmm. And so option two, um, they would then do it uh, when they put in their next one, it would be on the other side of that new one, in which case that flower bed would have to be removed at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Well, even if they put number two in, we could clean up that area. Yeah, we can. Take it out or put a nice bush in or something. Either location, we can still direct our staff to take that out. It is a very, with the trees and everything, I don't know if you guys have been out there. It's a very nice spot. And uh, just needs a little, a little cleanup with that flower bed. Option one is uh, um, I got the, map. the Zetner Funeral Homes preference. <clears throat> But they are fine with either. Let me make a motion. I'll make that motion for number one. Spot on. Question. Moved by Councillor Schultz to approve option one as presented for the location of the installation of a new columbarium to be operated by Zentner Funeral Home as per the letter of understanding. All in favor. Carry. Number 14, request for decision. Suspension of utility penalties and shutoff. Blair. Uh, so, uh, Premier Jason Kenney, um, in a press release on Wednesday, March 18th, announced numerous measures the Alberta government is taking to help Albertans uh, through the financial difficulties presented by COVID-19. Um, among other measures, the government is promising to help citizens through the deferral of electricity and natural gas charges. And uh, in that uh, press release, also asked municipalities to offer similar protection for water charges. Uh, so administration is recommending that the town suspend all utility penalties for non-payment as well as water shutoffs for non-payment until the end of june um now is if it's been continued beyond that we can obviously make another motion to extend it beyond june if need be um but uh, that's what we're proposing at this point in time so there would be no forgiveness or waiving of the utility bills themselves so utility customers would still need to be prepared to pay their full amount owing um when the uh, at the end of the uh waiver period um, but uh, it just does allow um, some deferral and relief uh, in the meantime. I think it's a great idea. But I think it's... I personally would like to see it go to the next billing. Sure. That's my opinion because people are going to just start getting in trouble anyway. From the unemployment. Mm -hmm. Uh, sp businesses that aren't going to be functioning. So we're going to start seeing them getting in trouble when, the, when the, there's going to be a bill due 
at the end of April, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that what I'm doing mm -hmm. that's right? Mm -hmm. So they're only going to start getting into trouble then. By the end of the next one is when the trouble is really going to happen. When we give them to the end of the next one, penalty free, I think there's some real relief. Mm -hmm. Is that giving them relief before they really get in trouble isn't kind of a key. So when I read this, I just was thinking about this. Would be removing their May bill, pushing it to the July bill. Just the penalty. Just right. No, and then not doing the interest on it. And the right, no, no, that's what I mean. They're pushing to the would they won't have for those have to pay May for moving May's bill to July. No. No, it's just any penalties. It's not changing this. No, I mean any bill else. anywhere. It's just that if they get into a situation like where they can't afford to pay it, or they're pushing but the what penalty, I'm saying is what color thing is is that uh, the May bill they would if they didn't pay it until July they right. wouldn't be penalized. Right. right. Um, whereas if they didn't pay it in July the way this is worded now they would be penalized at that point in time. What you're suggesting is to push it back another billing cycle, um, and so not have penalties kick in until end of August. Right. And my yes. point is yeah. the town's not losing revenue. Right. We're not cutting into anybody else's tax. Recovery. I mean, this is this is the penalty, and if we can help people that are going to, and there's going to be trouble. Right. We can see the businesses around town closing now, and right. there's a lot of unemployment coming from a lot of different areas that are laying off. I think the big relief they're going to need is time to recover. Mm -hmm. like, I agree with you. The bill after that. Yes. Yes. But we're not forgiving paying the bill. No. We're just simply not going to yeah. penalize them until right. they get a chance to try and exactly. Yep. So there's the, the May June bill that would be due the end of July, and then there's the July August bill that would be due the end of September. So do you want to push it all the way past September? Yes. Well, you'd say August, and then that's payable in September. Because this is June, then it's yeah. payable. Well, and, and looking at this again, I probably should have said July here, and so I'm thinking probably oh. push it to September. Well, then we should say September. End of September. It's not costing the town anything. No. It's giving people right. some kind of a chance. Right. Right. So what do you guys think of that? Yeah, I like the way that one was said. We process it. I'm in favor of that. The second yeah. is skip cost skip as soon as the billing cycle changes. Yeah, we're not moving the bill. We're just no, we're doing away with the penalty yeah. for two billing cycles. Right. Yeah. Which is four billing cycles for well, five billing cycles for the commercial. But yes. so yes. And the commercial is going to be harder hit, so they're going to need to release more. Yeah. Same time frame form, it's just less billing cycles. Yeah. Right. And most people, or all of us, I bet here, are on automated payments, mm -hmm. so it's not going to, it's not going to affect us. It's the people I'm talking about that are suddenly out of work, and their reserves are going to start running out in two months. Right. And that's and we and then we're kicking back in with penalties right. and the reserves are gone. Yeah, no. That's why I think we should extend the work period. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Does somebody need to go make that motion? I think that's kind of deep. Yeah. Councilor Cutler. <laughs> it's pretty tight there. Question. Moved by Councilor Cutler to approve the temporary suspension of utility penalties and utility shutoffs until September 30th, 2020, in response to the financial difficulties presented by COVID 19. All in favor? Carried. Number 15. Uh, Blair, big chair. So this is the addition to the agenda. <coughs> um, so as uh, mentioned briefly at the beginning, uh, when we added this to the agenda, the um, in response to uh, COVID-19, uh, the Clarison Daycare was closed on March 13th. Um, this has caused a ripple effect in the community, uh, specifically within the AHS uh, staff, who do not have other options to assist them in taking care of their young families. On March 20th, the Alberta government announced that daycares would be opening to support the AHS staff and other essential services staff, um, but these reopenings would be under strict regulations such as reduced child volumes, priority given to AHS and essential services staff, and strict sanitation protocols. 
Now, the Clarison Bay Care has been in conversation with the Alberta government, and at this point in time, uh, they weren't one of the facilities uh, selected. Uh, this time appears that only larger centres uh, were slated to reopen some of their daycares. Um, and uh, this does uh, continue to cause a problem for our uh, AHS staff and other essential services staff. Um, and so the uh, AHS has put together a letter of support for the Clarison Day Care to reopen that is attached here. Um, and uh, looking for a letter of support from Council uh, for that as well. No. Moved by Councillor Schultz to write a letter of support to the Honourable Casey Madu, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, to express our, the desire and support for the Clarison Child Care Society to be permitted to reopen its Clarison Daycare to care for the children <coughs> of workers in essential services, including our significant population of child care workers in our community, under the protocol set forth by the Alberta Government and Alberta Health Services. All in favour? Carried. Number 16, request for decision. Oh, we got to move these numbers. <laughs> request for decision. Child Care Society requests. That is for their uh, grant application. Uh, no, Maybe. it's for rent and utilities. Oh, rent and utilities. Yeah, they want to see. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, this is a no-brainer too. You want to give some background on that? Sure. Uh, so as uh, we just stated, mm -hmm. the Clarison Child Care Society has uh, been forced to close at this point in time uh, without the revenue um, being brought in uh, by caring for children. Um, they, uh, as a non-profit, they don't have much uh, extra reserves there. Uh, they, they play it pretty close to the vest. Um, and uh, so they are looking for uh, reprieve at this point in time for their uh, rent uh, for the daycare facility as well as the rent and utilities for the kids' own uh, facility um, during this uh, closure. Uh, that's an estimated uh, rental or estimated uh, seven hundred fifty dollars per month, uh, which includes hundred dollars rent for the day daycare facility, and then two hundred fifty dollars rent and four hundred dollars utilities for the kids' own facility. And this would be. Sorry, end of February. We forget March. Correct. So yeah, they, I think they've already paid February, but yeah. So so starting March one, basically. March twenty, you know, they're working five days this week. Yeah. Or whatever day, thirteen days. See, it's not clarifying here that we will be forgiving March until. We definitely can. I just to question. Yep. Um. Do you think it should be when it starts? Yeah, we can uh, say there just to uh, adjust the resolution there to waive rental utility fees beginning March 1. Yeah. Just to put some extra. An end date? I don't think an end date is. Uh, their their letter of request. Yeah, their letter of request basically says once they're reopened that they will continue payment. So I think that if the. The previous letter of support goes through and the, the daycare out here opens right away. Daycare rent could continue at that point in time. Kids' own rent would continue to be waived until kids' own opens. Well, and that's the other problem. Uh, if they get permission to open and it runs the scope just for out for our health, it, they're not going to be able to fund. Okay, which is rent. so. So I continue to waive until I both facilities are reopened. I think we should waive until, and then we'll we'll cross that bridge that council being responsible. Okay. Because by then they'll probably have an answer. So, in that previous letter, they wouldn't be open up kids' home? No, just daycare. Just zero to five. Uh, yeah. Um, not six to twelve. I, no, I think the school's closed, so there's no need for six to twelve. Sure, there is. But there is. No, there is. Yeah. Parents, <laughs> parents, are eight years old, they can't say, oh, by the I know, but it's all, it's um, all kids. Well, they just I, facilitate, uh, they like that facilitate it okay. all through here, is my understanding. Okay. Now, what age groups and whatever else, I don't know exactly how that's all going to work, but it would all be here. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, Kim, was, Kim was in talks to make sure that, that they could facilitate here. Oh, okay, great. Ads. Or there. It'd be one location. Right. But it's just and it would have to be here because they can't do that uh, in one large room. They have to have the multiple rooms to so quarantine to and whatever else. Okay. So I think 
I think it's start date for the thing, but an end date, I, I don't think is realistic because we don't know any, right. we don't have any definition. Right. We can address it by next council meeting. Hopefully we have some definition and we can address it then. If we don't, then we just leave it for now. If you're not compulsory, correct. If that's what they do. Yeah, that's yeah absolutely. Well, and, and the wording of the resolution recommended there, it says for the period of time that they're not operational. So that yeah. kind of covers it already there. Well, it does. But if they go partially back, then I think that's still not operational. Right. Okay. And that's fine. And we could we could add in there for a period of time they're not fully operational. Yeah. Let's, let's, could we put that in there? Sure. Because if they only get back and they're allowed to have something, that's not going to put any good. Mm -hmm. Or barely cover the staff. Probably won't cover the staff. Yeah, sure. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> okay, would somebody like to make that first motion? Councillor okay. Carlson, can you speak up a bit? I didn't hear you. I would like to make that motion. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you, Councillor Carlson. <laughs> Question. Moved by Councillor Carlson to waive the rental and utility fees beginning March 1st, 2020 for the Franklin Childcare Society for the period of time that they are not fully operational due to the cottage foreclosure and our license to insure facility. All in favor? Carried. Request for decision. Arena Roof. Mezzanine. Right. Uh, so the flat portion of the arena roof is overdue for replacement. Uh, and um, it it has been included in the 2020 budget along with the mezzanine floor in the arena building, which has been damaged from the leaking of the flat portion of the roof. Um, our infrastructure department has reached out and got three different uh, contractor quotes for the work. Um, <coughs> ranging from 72,000 to 136,000 for just for the arena roof portion. Um, and then there would be an additional 3,900 required for the replacement of the skylight. Um, now this, uh, the 72,000 is, is well below uh, what our original uh, estimate was for, for this work. Um, we had estimated the work there at about 136,000 at the, the top end of those quotes. Now this uh, project was to be funded both by uh, Community Facility Enhancement Program or CFET grant uh, through the minor hockey as well as the federal gas tax fund. Uh, now the CFET grant we haven't heard word on yet and we won't hear word on that and probably, until probably the fall at the earliest. Um, so if we want this uh, work to, to be done this year, uh, we um, need to proceed before that uh, we receive word on that grant. Um, the mezzanine flooring um, also requires replacement before it can be used, um, but uh, delaying that work won't cause any further damage, it would just delay the availability of the mezzanine to be used. Uh, so basically, uh, as this project is below the 200000 we're not looking for Council to award the, uh, the contract or the project, we're just looking for uh, direction from Council as to whether or not we should proceed uh, prior to hearing on the CFEP grant. Um, there's three different options here. One is to uh, proceed with the, or sorry, uh, let me put these in order. Um, first one is not to proceed with the project until we receive word on the CZEC grant application. The second option is to proceed just with the arena roof replacement um, and uh, wait on the mezzanine floor portion of the project until a CFEP grant application is, is uh, approved. And option three is to proceed with the full project despite the uncertainty of the CFEP grant application and if the CFEP grant application is unsuccessful to approve an additional 25000 um, required for the full, full project out of the federal gas tax fund grant. Option one, my vote. Well done. To the uh, mezzanine floor of the roof line. So option not, one is to not do anything. Not proceed with that. Until we hear, hear from the grant. And uh, just just the floor is for the grant, right? No. The grant was to be applied for the total cost of the well, to offset part of the total cost of the project. 
57 profiles. Is the resolution bad enough? Yeah. Hey, I think there's no renter using the mezzanine at this time, is there? Not at this time. Not right now. The gas tube was left there and gone. Because of the flooring. Because of the flooring? Yeah, I'm not sure on that. I'd have to, right now, I'd just say right now everyone's barred from the building, but. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there is that. <laughs> And what was the flooring part of this? The flooring part uh, is estimated at uh, 110 less the 72 is what, 38? Thirty-eight thousand. Well, I would. I, I'd like I, to see us repair the roof, but fixing the mezzanine floor at this time. And we don't the, know about the funding. Within the gas tax funding, we cover the. But the gas tax funding is also being used for the new uh, multi utility. But we have the budget. Right? Yeah, yeah, but, but uh, what Mike is saying is, is within what was already budgeted within the federal gas tax, it would cover the roof on its own. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's what I'm talking about. Don't do the floor for now. Yeah, I'd like to see the roof done if it's leaking because I know when it is leaking, it causes problems on the ice surface. It causes problems to the lake. The floor could wait until the season get back down. Good. Would you suggest we make the that's my suggestion, but I think uh, I'm not against what Brad said either, holding back until we have the time. I mean, it's 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 a tough one to pick. Yeah, I, I will it. say that because the grant application is already in, if we are successful, uh, it can be applied to the roof that we've already fixed because that application is already in. Now, if we're unsuccessful and we try to reapply, then we can't go back and apply it at that point in time. So we could apply for the floor at that point. We could. I still like Bob's opinion. My it's a big I like maintaining. My opinion is you put a lot of work into that rink and maybe it's been a lot of upgrades and to have that leak that you guys can get to work. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's going to happen with the next snowfall, the next thaw, or whatever. It's something that's been pushed off and I think the rink needs to be checked up to the point where it mm -hmm. services the people that take care of that leak in the middle of that ice sheet before it goes back to the council again. Well, it's also dangerous for the skaters. Right. Well, it is. I vote for number two. Yeah, I, I, I didn't reinforce my position to start, but I understand not spending money when you know, things are a little iffy. But I also don't agree with having to when you put the amount of money we put into that rink in last year. I don't agree with letting it slip any further. Mm -hmm. No, we've been in a position where. The gas, since the gas tax and what was budgeted for it already got ignored. Um, I would say it needs to be done now. At that time, since we already have pretty good intent for what the net cost is going to be, it's naturally more. I always say that. Um, to make that happen, and that's just as cringeworthy as I think um, grant funding is going to be after this COVID is all done with. Um, I don't think we'll see the grant funding, but we can't be in a position where we let infrastructure like the roof fall through the fall through the cracks, unfortunately. So as much as I would like to delay it um, for grant funding, I don't see the grant funding coming. It needs to be done. So I would go off to number two. Well, if somebody would like to make a motion. Councillor Cutler. I'll make a motion for option two. Any other debate? Craig, you can ask Brad. This is Gordon. Stacy Baldwin. Okay, question. Moved by Councillor Cutler to direct administration to proceed with only the, uh, the energy replacement portion of the Unity and Multi Unit Forest Project. 
until such time as we have received word on the prefix grant application. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 18 request for decision. North Industrial Paving. Sir. So the North Industrial Area has been scheduled for paving for a uh, number of years, uh, but it's consistently been postponed uh, due to budgetary concerns. Uh, during the 2020 budget discussion, administration was asked to obtain quotes on this uh, paving or updated quotes on this paving. Uh, due to the current oil prices and labor market, the prices come down significantly from previous quotes. Um, as such, council uh, directed administration or, or council included in the 2020 capital budget uh, this project. Um, we engaged ISL Engineering and Land Services uh, to help uh, to uh, manage this project. Uh, they put the pro project out for tender. Uh, tender closed on March 11th, 2020, with seven proposals being submitted. Prices came in a little higher than, than expected or than budgeted, um, with quotes ranging from 439,000 and change to 558,000 and change. Um, as per the attached letter from ISL, they are recommending the low bidder. Um, they their uh, Calgary office has worked with the, the low bidder before and they received an initial reference as well and they have no concerns uh, with this contractor. Um, now, uh, the with the contractors, uh, the low bid contractor price as well as the costs for ISL engineering, uh, designing and managing this project, uh, we would be looking at a total cost of $455,508. Um, the approved budget for this project was four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So this would put us over budget by five thousand five hundred and eight dollars and forty three cents, or an increase of about one point two percent. Now there uh, was some estimates in this project uh, with the uh, surveying, with the ice and snow on the road and whatnot. The gravel quantities are estimated. Uh, our director of infrastructure does think that they are they are high. I think that there can be some cost savings there. Um, as well as this does include contingency that we hope we will fully utilize. Um, but we are looking for a uh, motion from council to approve the over budget of $5,500 just to make sure that we are covered um, if uh, it does uh, utilize the full amount there. So we're just looking for a motion to um, to award the project as well as, uh, sorry I missed that in the, the resolution there. Uh, to approve the additional five thousand and fifty, or sorry, fifty five hundred and eight dollars um, over budget uh, to be funded out of uh, federal gas tax. So you bring in your motion opposed. So it's in it's in the total. It, no, it's in the total, but it's not in the uh, additional motion to approve out of budget expenditure. Oh yeah, the motion after this. It can be part of the same mm -hmm. motion. Or it, it can be either. either way. Okay. Questions? Any questions on this? Yeah. Oil dropped to like 15 bucks. <laughs> we wait another year, it might be zero. It might be three. It might be less. I should have been asking for a credit for all that. What's that? Do you think we wait longer than this one? Maybe. No. Price of oil will go up because there's no limit to structures. Oh, okay. But is there any construction that happens? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kenyon's going to make sure <laughs> there's people there. Okay, so somebody will introduce this motion. Councillor Foshberger with the uh, verbiage you're adding on the end, so hear it clearly. Moved by Councillor Swashburger to award the North Industrial Paving Project to Professional Excavators and Construction Inc. in the value of $439,518.43 plus GST and to approve the $5,510 out of budget expenditure to be funded out of the federal gas tax fund. Very much. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Number 19 request decision, tennis courts research. Clerk. Uh, so similar to the um, uh, arena roof project, uh, this is another project uh, that is, is part of the 2020 capital budget. 
uh, with the um, the bid to, to host the 2021 Summer Alberta Southern Alberta Summer Games. Um, we are uh, needing to resurface our tennis courts to be able to uh, facilitate that uh, hosting. Um, but uh, this project was uh, slated to be funded um, half by uh, Community Facility Enhancement Program or CFAT grant funds, as well as uh, funds from the Southern Alberta Recreation As Association. Um, that CFAP grant, we have not received word on that yet and don't expect to receive word until the fall, um, which would be too late to, to do the resurfacing in this season. Um, as well as we haven't heard uh, confirmation on the Southern Alberta Recreation Association funds as well as either. Now the bid or the quote we received on this project is below um, what we had budgeted. Uh, it did come in low. Uh, we had budgeted eighty five thousand dollars. It came in at sixty five thousand four forty eight for the low bid on the quote we received. Um, but uh, that still would uh, mean that there is uh, thirty eight thousand dollars unfunded if we don't receive the CFAP grant or the FARA funds. And so just looking for uh, direction from council as to whether we should proceed in this season to get that done in preparation for the 2021 Summer Games or if we should defer. I think don't we need it done? Right? We don't need it done. Well, I think for, because uh, uh, if we're hosting the Games in 2021, first off, we don't have the grant for the Manning Valley. We don't have the CFAP. So the $39,000 short on the grant. There would be ample time if we receive those grants in the fall and we get the grants from the uh, Southern the Alberta Games that it could be slated for uh, late spring before the Canadian Games. No, there's not ample time even for this season. We're already booking out into August. But and we the will know this fall. So we we hopefully able. would, yeah. So I'm just saying there's not necessarily ample time. It depends on, on other schedules and whatnot. But uh, yes, there definitely is the possibility of doing there's it. There's a possibility we could do it in the spring. In the spring or, or early summer. As soon as we get the money in place. Or even if we get the money in place, like at least the Southern Alberta Games, we could readdress this this summer <laughs> and book it now for next spring. So my question for the, for Daisy is, if we don't get the CFAP and we don't get the Southern Alberta Recreation Association money, are the town with the same funding going to cover that and not moving forward? I don't think we could. I mean, we got enough going on in our problem with, without. To me, this is something that maintenance of the uh, roof of the arena leaking yeah. is one thing. This, but this if we've agreed to host this event, it's a big event. It's a big event. We're agreeing to host it. Are we not running the potential of it not the project not being completed? Well, they're the ones with the shortfall of the fifteen thousand. They haven't given us anything. We should have had word from them by now. They're the ones that are putting us in jeopardy. That's my opinion. Just and it, I mean, we can't go by the past or whatever. But last time we had the summer games, tennis courts weren't really overly utilized. I think we could tighten things up a little bit. Just because I, I was there looking at them, and I mean. A whole bunch of kids just won and they didn't even have courts or whatever because there wasn't much in that. There was some older, there was some games that were played, but it's not like that there's, so the tennis a, isn't the main focus. It's, a it's, it's some of it that's there. It's, it's there, but. Putting on the summer games for next year is an important thing. And if you had a place also used for pickleball as well, isn't that court used for pickleball? It's not in summer games. No, I meant. Pickleball may be in. Is that too? Oh, it might be. It will be at Summer Games. And what's yeah, that? But not right now. Sport, <clears throat> and this would important. include all the painting and drawing sport or pickleball and tennis to have it all set up for that. It would host more than one event. So it's a 40,000. I wasn't aware of that. Yep, no, yeah. not, yeah, that, that's where it is a very, it is an important part to the Gun Summer Games. I mean, I understand the 15,000 from the SARA, SARA is, is important, but the 42,500. If we don't get that from the CFAP, I, I just hate to see the Our part. shortfall is just under 40. So if we get the 15, that's 25. Yeah, because that would support whatever you guys decide. There's three money, two gifts, I think. 
I agree with you, and, and I mean, the loop of the reading is one thing where it says, uh, for I do think this is important that we discuss it to some degree. It is an important part for the Southern Bay community to have this done moving forward. But I also know we have other projects that need to be done. I just don't want to see it go by the wayside. If I, like you said, feel assured that we have plenty of time if we hear from the speech rep in the fall. Well, we, maybe. I'm just, we may not get it, but. The writing is off here. So what you're saying is that projects this year are booking into August already to get done. So if we wait till fall, we may not be able to get that project. It's possible. Right, I see what you're saying. Right? Yeah, and and it's also possible we don't get this contractor and we end up paying eighty thousand for it or six, yeah. instead of sixty five or whatever. So there's that there's there's risk to it. So right. Does that make a decision on your end? I vote for two thousand. And then have we had like what you said like is somebody actually is this something that does need to be done? Like, if we wait and decide, you know what, we're not going to do it now just because of budgetary stuff, would it hinder the play and the results? Yes. Does it absolutely have to be done? If it's not done, they won't host those events at all. Is that what you're saying, Mike? I don't think that's true. <laughs> so they could play, it'd just be nicer to have a friend of service. So from the meeting that I can recall was back in this one meeting in 2003 in Dale told us that it would benefit to have all the fine paper on there. Now if you're asking us if technically we cancel because our courts are so bad that they can't play on, I don't think that's where it's at. But it's been on your yeah. project list for so long. But I don't think that's where that's at. So no, it wouldn't cancel the game. Increase our potential for getting games back again if we had them there and didn't have the court staff. I, I don't think it really affects us. Well, I mean, a part, of the, part of the summer game, game, part of the summer games process is the the infrastructure that's needed for longevity and those types of things. So I guess it's part of it, but not as much as it can be. I would, I would say yeah. that too. Like, but we might be. We budgeted for this and just don't think we can. Grants didn't come through. The economy's changed. That's why I think Brian's the right to the gut. And whichever way we decide, it's fine. We just gotta make sure we're comfortable with what we decide. I am a little bit more concerned. I'm more concerned about our taxpayer right now than I am about the service of the tennis court or the athletics or whatever. Because I am just one that every day is very frankly what it is. Um, the amount that I see is uh, I can't justify taking the risk right now. I think <coughs> I would like to see us play and get the tennis court at least the Sarah funded and the C Prep again. Is it possible to communicate with the Sarah people and see where they're at? If are they is there the movement that they're in? Can we do that? Can we reach out to them and say find that out? And then make a decision at our next council meeting because it's shall this is our next council meeting. We'll get have bumped if we don't decide now. Is that what you're saying? Probably. Say it again. Do what? Um, our slot that they've put us in, uh, they're only willing to hold it for I can't remember what it is, fourteen days or mm -hmm. twenty days or whatever. We don't have a council meeting for three weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, it's already been uh, we well, we got this vote uh, over a week ago now already. So, um. I think that uh, delaying it until next council meeting um, would help us, you know, if we made a decision at that point in time, it would help us secure a position in the spring if we wanted to do that, um, being this early. Um, but we might lose our position to do it this year. And that would be okay. <coughs> if we could secure a place in the spring. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what you're saying is we can go back to this contract and ask to come back and visit in the spring instead of this year. We can try and try and secure it while we can for for early twenty twenty one. Yeah. No guarantee I haven't talked to them, but uh, we can definitely try. I feel comfortable taking that risk. Go ahead. Brad, you have a second. Option one. 
Um, so I guess, do you want to defer it until we hear on the CFAT grant, or do, you, or do you want us to change the wording on that and change it, or defer it until we hear on the um, we, uh, Sarah fund? How about you, uh, no. I would suggest to make the motion to be deferred to the CFAT grant. That would give us some time to get information. Does that mean to defer? Well then, no, we can't, no. Brad has a motion on the table. And then it's a vote, we will vote on it. Marcy. Moved by Councillor Foster, we be directed administration to not proceed with the town support resurfacing project until such time as we receive word on the CFIP grant application and the Sarah funding. All in favor. Opposed. Carried. Moving on. Financial report, statement of operations. There's, there's no, we don't need a motion for that anymore, do we? We need to get a view of that a couple years ago. Information brief, letter of support. Oh, sorry, just kidding. We do need a motion. <laughs> <laughs> Jones, Jones, just kidding. Okay, should we flip the coin? Which one is late? <laughs> to be green. She does it more than I do. <laughs> okay. We need a motion to accept the financial report. All in favor? Carry. Okay, we're moving on. Information. Letter of support community foundation grants. This has been done. Uh, right. Background. Uh, so the Clareswim Child Care Society, uh, as well as the Clareswim Animal Rescue Society, have applied to the community foundation um, for uh, grants. The Clareswim Child Care Society has submitted the application uh, for $15,000 towards furnishing their new building. Um, and the Animal Rescue Society has submitted an application for uh, $3,000 for a cat spay neuter program to help control the cat population in the community. Uh, deadline for this application is March 16th, uh, so as per uh, the town policy for grant funding, pol uh, the grant town grant funding policy, um, administration did uh, proceed with letter of support uh, for those um, as they are asking for any uh, monetary contributions. Um, just uh, for support of those applications. We did issue those uh, on March 12th and March 16th, respectively, and they are attached. Okay. Thank you. Number 22, information brief, CFAP grant notifications. There's no good news here. Uh, this will give us a bad news. <laughs> So the Clareson Child Care Society, as well as the Clareson Lions Club, have both received notification that their grant applications uh, for the CFIP uh, program were unsuccessful. Uh, the Child Care Society had applied for a grant application for their new facility uh, to cover costs of subdivision, servicing, and fencing costs. Um, and then the Lions Club has applied for a grant for their gazebo and entrance modifications to the northeast corner of Amazon Park. Uh, both of those applications were uh, denied. And I think we'll see a lot more of those over the next little while. So then we have a reassignment. Number 22, 23, information brief enabling accessibility grant. Uh, so we received a very welcome surprise call about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so I guess to back up a little bit, the um, the Government of Canada Enabling Accessibility Fund uh, was a fund that uh, we applied um, to back in July uh, for the construction and installation of the, uh, of the elevator for the multi-use community building when we were looking at the renovation project. Um, we received word that uh, we were unsuccessful in that grant application. Uh, we received a call about a week and a half ago uh, saying they have extra funds and uh, is our project, uh, have we moved forward on that project yet and do we still need the money? Um, I said, yes, we we're moving forward on that project, but it has changed. Um, can we still qualify for this? And they said, well, put together uh, the, the amendment to it and, and submit it and we'll look at it. Uh, so despite the um, change uh, from a renovation to a new building, we were able to get uh, cost uh, estimates from uh, Tricon 
on all the costs for accessible bathrooms, accessible doors, entrance doors, um, uh, accessible uh, ramps up uh, off the, the pavements on the sidewalk, uh, the pavement for the handicapped parking stalls, uh, and all that included in there. Um, the municipal contribution required for the project is 35%. Um, so with all of those costs, uh, we were successful in receiving a grant uh, funding for $55,784.95 towards our multi-use project. Yeah. Well done. Number 24, information brief, pitch, pitch in Canada week. Can we say self-explanatory? We usually do it April 25th. At this time, administration is recommending we postpone the town wide cleanup until such time as we incorporate a disclosure out there. What do you think? We don't need a motion. I think we leave the date wide open for now, too. Okay. Do it at 25. Looks good. Bring it back. and Might be next year. It might very well be. Mm -hmm. I, I would realistically believe it probably will be next year. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> okay, we'll move on. 25, information brief to the AO report. Nothing surprising in there. Any questions? 26 information brief council resolutions. Any questions? Okay. And 27 adoption of information items. Do we need a motion for that? All in favor? Carries. And a motion to go on camera, please. Councillor Schultz, camera off, please. Okay, would somebody like to make a motion to come out of in-camera? I would like to make a motion to come out of in-camera. Yeah, these two put their hands in this. I don't know what's going on here. Councilor Zimmer, all in favor of coming out of in-camera? Carries. And a motion to adjourn. No, I can't get that open this time. Okay, well, let's go. You can have it forever. <laughs> He's already had you wrote down before he said a word. We are adjourned. Camera off, please. <laughs> <laughs> wow.